Um, we are talking uh, to a system like, like that. The problem we have to solve is, in fact, uh, a huge problem. We have an open system in general. Now I sketch it in two contacts, but in general, even one contact or one extended lead would be enough if it be an open system. But if you have two or more contacts, you can drive it out of equilibrium. So non-equilibrium in general, and in principle, many body, uh, many body problem where electrons interact, but you can have interaction with phonons, photons, everything. So <clears throat> it is, uh, in fact, a, a huge problem, and there are some practical solutions to that. Uh, first of all, how to treat the open bounded condition, and one popular is the Green's functions. One can also do and the density matrix uh, uh, based approaches, but uh, okay. Uh, the Green's function is certainly a, a, a nice method because it is relatively simple when you have a single particle. The formulation we will also have a look at the main ingredients, and it's not too complicated. But the nice thing is that it can be extended you know, to, to many bodies, you know, this uh, Green's function, many bodies that the really. That was developed before the 70s. And then Caroli was one of the first to, 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 to develop a theory of, of transfer. The famous Landauer formula, in fact, was, uh, was derived much before by, by Caroli. Uh, and then the many body, or the electron electron part, is treated uh, uh, with DFT. That's why DFT uh, transport. Uh, and this is a way to, as you know, it, it is okay to, to map in principle exactly the, um, uh, the, the, the effective single particle Hamiltonian. Problem is that when you are out of equilibrium, the problem system is not anymore in a ground state. So it is not well funded, this approach that was basically Imagine initially by Lang, and then also this famous paper of Venta and Veliges and Lang of 2000. They were giving the start to all these codes, which uh, basically put together the non equilibrium Green's function machinery with DFT. Transiesta was one of the first to implement that, but then many others came uh, as legal, and, uh, and then uh, many, many codes uh, merged. Let's say the DFT formulation with, with the NEGF business. And we will see uh, some how it works. But this is not a uh, warning that this is not a well, well based theory because it is DFT is good for a ground state equilibrium system. Uh, and like the system we are working uh, is non equilibrium by, by construction. So, uh, the NEGF uh, plus DFT is, a, is an approximation. Good one or a bad one, it has depends. Okay, <clears throat> but I want to, I don't want to bother you too much with the theory, apart from giving you some ideas of, of how this works, just to, to have an intuition of what you will see, or what we will look at this morning. Now, the, the basic ingredient is this Green's function. And well, the simple way to understand it is to start to think in terms of the Schrodinger equation. You have, uh, uh, for instance, the time dependent Schrodinger equation that can, and we work, we will work at this application always in steady state. I don't have a time dependent formulation. Uh, Good. Um, what, what it's implemented is a steady state uh, uh, NEGF. So, <clears throat> what the, the Schrodinger equation, when you go to steady state, you have the usual circular equation and eigen, eigen problem to solve. Uh, you, you can do the same thing with the Green's function. Basically, when you think in time, uh, you can think of the Green's function as uh, uh, an object that contains and map the response of your system to uh, an impulse, a delta function that is, uh, it's like creating a perturbation at t equal 
prime. So at t prime, you create a configuration, and then you look at what happens uh, either um, for t greater than t prime, so after the perturbation, or mathematically, you can also look backward in time if you want a t uh, lower than t prime. So, in fact, the Green's function is a, a well known method to solve the differential equations that embeds also the boundary conditions, if you want. Uh, and once you have the Green's function, you can always find the wave function of any initial condition, for instance, by integrating this object. You know, this is the response you integrate with the psi of, uh, of the initial condition, and then, and then you, you can evolve. Basically, GR is your evolving, uh, evolving operator. Uh, in fact, the Green's function, if you go to, to energy, so when you fully transform that object, you have to be a bit careful because this delta function that you put um, is creating a sort of discontinuity actually in the solution, uh, a cusp. And, uh, certainly there is a discontinuity in the derivative because you are saying, okay, the derivative of G is equal to delta, the derivative in time is equal to delta, that means that there is a, a discontinuity uh, on G. Uh, in fact, you, you can separate uh, positive time or say T minus T prime positive, and then you have the retarded, the so-called retardator, retarded uh, propagator, the retarded this function. And for T lesser, lower than T prime, you have the advanced, whatever it's before. I, when you Fourier transform to energy, this difference of retarded and advanced map into this beautiful I delta, I plus, I, so you have this small imaginary part here, uh, which we call delta in the next slide. But you have to think at the limit of delta that tends to zero from the positive side. And then you have G retarded. If you take the limit of delta that goes from the negative side, you have the G advanced. Why so? Because if you think of a single level, think of a single level and, the, and to construct the Green's function of that single energy level, which we call epsilon alpha. Okay, this would be the retarded Green's function of a single level. You have a function of energy. It's one of the, this, this inverse comes from this equation. You see, you have uh, the Fourier transform of, of that. Delta becomes unity. The, the, the operator becomes, I mean, the derivative of the time becomes energy. The Hamiltonian remains such. So you have a, a, an operator times G that operates on G equal again. So formally, the, the G, the Green's function is the inverse of that operator. And we will see what that we won't see the algorithm too much, but bear in mind that the Green's function comes as an inverse of an operator. So if you have a single scalar level, the inverse is just one over <coughs> minus I epsilon. And we put this plus I delta with the idea that delta is very small. Uh, numerically, once we do the calculation, we need to put a number typically of the order of 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5 dB, say. Uh, of course, things depend a little bit on this delta, but not the final calculation. Um, then, then, when you Fourier transfer back to time, this plus I delta has the magic of making the this G retarded analytic on the upper side, but the pole, the, the, if you look, there is a pole at, epsilon, at E equal epsilon uh, A alpha, which is, has been shifted a bit lower in, in the, in the lower uh, part of the, you, you have always to think in terms of complex functions. So the here is really the realm of what you learn at some point, probably of all these complex contour integration. So, oh yeah. uh, so if you have this high delta 
in the lower part of the complex plane, that means that the Gilles carpet is analytic <coughs> on the upper part. And when you fully transform from energy to time, basically from for T lower than zero, you have to close above and you get zero because basically the, 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 the contour integration is zero. And when it, you have T greater than zero, you have to close below, otherwise nothing converge. And, uh, and, uh, and you get therefore a theta is every side function. So that I delta maps into an every side function. Basically. And that's really a retarded object that, that tells you that why it is retarded basically because uh, it is actually uh, non-zero for T greater than, than zero. Okay, here I lumped uh, T minus T prime into a single T. I relabel T minus T prime into T. So if you see in time, you have an oscillating object like uh, like the wave function that oscillates for a, for a, for a higher states in time, e to the i or minus i epsilon alpha t, h bar can be one most of the time. Then this i delta becomes a, a small something that in the limit of delta that goes to zero, is close to one, but you remain with a with an other side function. If you do the, the minus i delta, you have the advanced Lewis function, and, uh, and then you have another side of minus t. So that would be non zero for t low, lower than zero. So that's a, that's it. <laughs> this is the, the retarded Lewis function uh, as the mathematical. Uh, Work. Now, now, what we can do with the Lewis function, for instance, we can calculate the imaginary part of that object. And, and look, we have, uh, if we take the imaginary part of that, you get uh, a delta function. So, this is what you would expect from for the density of state of a, of a localized, uh, well defined energy level of energy epsilon alpha. No? So the imaginary part of geodata is the best to say. Or anyway, uh, most of the time, if you handle matrices where maybe G retarded minus G advanced, you have a difference between matrices. G advanced is typically the dagger, a joint of G retarded. So usually it is for me, when you work with matrices, uh, it's not directly the imaginary part, but uh, but something close. Conceptually, is the imaginary. Uh, so yeah, that that's basically the basis, very simple basis of Gilbert and, and how it works. And another very nice thing of of Green's function and the reason why they are used uh, for open bounded condition is the following. Now think of a simple, okay, that was coming from a story already to people, engineers. <laughs> okay, things are, are uh, simple, but still nice. So think of a simple two, two by two, uh, an atom, or like an hydrogen atom, you have the bonding, anti-bonding. Now start thinking you have these two levels and think that you put some contact next to them. Then you start maybe thinking at a small cluster, of atom can be gold, whatever. They will have their own level, possibly low, the state will be localized on the contacts. Some state will go will across the, the system with some probability. So these dotted lines. And you will still have the level of the of the two of the hydrogen molecule with this uh, energy. And the, that level will start hybridizing with the with the contact. Now you put more and more and more. You, you go to the limit of infinite bulbs. At some point in that limit, the density of state of the, of the contact becomes a continuum. And the, uh, and the original level of the hydrogen molecule become broadened level. They, they acquire uh, a broadening, basically, which is what remains of these many, many states that can cross uh, and cross the system. 
the magic of the Lean's function is that okay, we can we can remap all this goofy stuff into into the Hamiltonian of the of the of this molecule with a self energy. This is basically an embedding self energy that embeds all the boundary conditions of this uh, of the infinite content. The same so in the end, the self energy typically depends on, on energy itself. In the simple, in the most simple case, you just have a, an imaginary path broadening. And why uh, imaginary part is directly connected to, to a broadening. And the real part of the self energy will change the states of, of, of the obvious. So you see here uh, that I draw a broadening of the level. Okay, yeah, it's a bit clumsy, but the idea is that a broadening in, in energy maps to, uh, if you look back in time, uh, to either the Green's function or even you think that the wave function square, uh, a broadening maps to, because of the uncertainty principle in energy, uh, an uncertainty in energy maps to an uncertainty in time. That is, it maps to a state that uh, is not a state, a real state. state. It's a state that decays. In fact, an imaginary part in the Green's function becomes uh, an evanescent a state that has a, a decaying e to the minus gamma t. What does it mean? It means that if I put an electron in one of these states, at some point, after a while, it will disappear. Where? It disappears in an infinite context. Um, so actually, only in the limit of any of infinite contacts, you have a proper uh, broadening of, of the level. If the contacts are finite, there is always a time when the electron will go away, but then it will bounce back. So you really need mathematically an infinite contact, let's say, to, to, to have a uh, well, rigorously an imaginary self energy. Okay, this is also an important point because it links uh, the language of, of this function to, to what we need for, for an to treat an open boundary system. Now, today, we will mainly play with this uh, structure, which is not too complicated to run in reasonable time. It is still fashionable, this graphene nano ribbon, and uh, when we can learn something. So, we will play with this structure, we will build it uh, from basics and, uh, and we will start constructing a transport calculation along uh, initially an ideal graphene nano ribbon, then we will start putting a defect onto it. Uh, and then let's see how it goes. We can decide what to do. So, as I explained, the code basically. In building these self energies uh, and the self energy of the contact don't really normalize the um, Hamiltonian of the central region. So <clears throat> when we do this transport calculation, we always need to partition our system into a central region. We call central region, scattering region, somebody call it a device region. Let's speak with central region, maybe it's a bit more intuitive what we mean. Central, and then you have, let's say, if we work with two contacts, you have the left lead and right, right. And, and each has its own self energy, and the, the two are summed up. Or, in fact, because <coughs> where, where things are working, why things are working <coughs> properly? Because we are working with local orbit. Um, so with local orbitals, basically, it means that you have a finite range of interactions between the orbital of, of one atom and the orbital of another atom. And that essentially allows to 
to first it allows to do this partitioning in a clear way, especially when you know our uh, data set uh, Okay, maybe I'm, I'm leaving on my reason now in a, in a different direction, but okay, the local orbital we will discuss later on. Uh, but the, the bear in mind the story with the local orbital because it's that that allows you to calculate actually the, the self energies in practice. If you were trying to formulate this problem with plane waves, you can still formally say that there is an embedding potential and embedding self energy, but computing that in practice is certainly more complicated. And we know that there were some developments at some point, but most of the successful codes like if you do quantum espresso calculation, then you need to go to the near function, you need to rotate to the near function, which are localized, and then with those, you can calculate the self energy. And then you can uh, formulate this partitioning in a clear way, because really you need to partition the Hamiltonian in two blocks, and only local orbitals with finite range interaction allows you to really to cut and say, okay, this is the Hamiltonian of my central part, and I have an Hamiltonian of my context and a finite range of interactions between that. My reasoning here was also, I wanted to present to you quickly the idea that uh, with Green's function, you can also treat many body interactions. So unfortunately, we will not be able to do it today, but the idea is that you can, uh, the same concept of self energy, you can also have, uh, you can treat electron phonon, electron photon, or, or other type of, of electron electron interactions. So you can treat, in fact, many body effects. And that goes with all these many body perturbation theory, the Feynman diagrams. So you can construct lowest order interaction between the the propagator of the free electron or free propagator that I don't know at some point the meta photon then absorb the photon again or the meta photon we absorb the photon and you can solve this Dyson equation and finally you discover that your Green's function can be written okay you have the the leads the contact that embeds the open boundary condition but you can also put uh, the self energies of other interactions. Well, of course, the calculation of each of these objects then requires a specific uh, evaluation of one of these uh, five and diagram in the end. So it might not be that straightforward, but in principle, it can be done. And when you are in, a, in out of equilibrium, uh, practically you have two objects you have to, to, to use. In equilibrium, the G retarded is enough to describe everything like the wave function out of equilibrium or the second wave function out of equilibrium there are two objects in the end i cut a couple of slides uh, because they start to be too heavy but remember that of course you know out of equilibrium the, the g retarded knows about the density of states huh? he said but you also need how these states are occupied how they are occupied that's another ingredient independent from, from the from the retarded phase function. In equilibrium would be enough to say, okay, I multiply that by the Fermi function. If I multiply D by the Fermi function, Fermi distribution, I occupy all states uh, with that up to a certain defined Fermi level. And if there is finite temperature, you know you have this Fermi distribution. So in equilibrium. Uh, the, the, the occupation of the states is, is clear. Out of equilibrium is non clear, I mean, non clear in the sense that uh, the occupation of the state depends on the interaction between particles. Um, so you have a non equilibrium situation. So this, there is another object called G lesser. I don't want to enter too much in the detail of how this is computed, only strict necessary later. Uh, and the density of electron is the integral of, of this other object. In equilibrium, again, the G lesser is simply F times the imaginary part of G retarded. So um, there is one independent object. 
out of equilibrium, the two are really different. Uh, you cannot simply take the, the spectrum and uh, occupy with one defined. And in fact, okay, we put this here and we will come back to that later, but there is a famous pattern of Bayan equation that in steady state reads like that and tells you what GLS in principle is. And GLS is this object that connects to this sigma less. Sigma less, in turn, if you just have, uh, um, if you don't have interactions, many body interaction, but just the, the self energy of the contacts, you, have, you can write down at the end this expression. So what is this? Uh, you have uh, sigma less. If you put that into, into this equation, you end up with this. What is this? Is it's saying that the occupation, that my, my density, that the state occupation is uh, from the left lead uh, L, all the state that emerge, this is the density of state coming from the left lead, basically. You can imagine state arriving from the left lead, and then they can be reflected and transmitted. So this, this is the density of state of left uh, propagating states that are occupied with the left Fermi function. And this is the density of the right propagating state, which is occupied with the right uh, distribution. And therefore, this is the simple, the simplest uh, expression to write GLS for um, an open boundary with just two contacts. But this is generally to have three and n contacts is the sum of the Fermi function of each of the reservoir, which is assumed in equilibrium. Yeah, we have to assume that something is in equilibrium. In this calculation, we assume that the contacts at some point are in equilibrium. It means that we can define a Fermi level. And then you have this uh, density of propagating states. Uh, that is G retarded, gamma is like broadening due to the, to the, um, is the rate at which states enter from the left lead, basically, times G advanced. Uh, and, and you can demonstrate uh, also with the little bit of algebra that you recover the equilibrium expression if you have just one Fermi level. Of course, F right equal F left, you can bring it to one side. And then gamma left plus gamma right is the total gamma. And it's not too complicated to show that it's G retarded gamma G advances, in fact, the spectral density. So basically, you recover the expression of equilibrium. You occupy all states in a well defined Fermi distribution with a density of states uh, also defined that this is strict parent of the marginal part of G retarded. In fact, this is G retarded minus G advanced. Uh, so, my bad. The main takeaway concept is that out of equilibrium. Uh, but still without uh, uh, without all the interaction between particles, electron form and things, you can still write it, everything in a sort of simple way. So this is the S, uh, in the end, even in GF, it's doing, there is a library behind the, the interfacing of, of, of the instruction and transport with the FPD plus, which we call even in GF. And the reason for doing that is that it's given EGF is also an LGPR library, sort of standalone project that uh, can be interfaced to different formulations. We, we interface to uh, CAD code from FiberCAD, so a finite element. Attention, attention. My alarm testing is about to commence. Oh. <laughs> so the announcement will be made when testing is complete. Oh. Thank you. So we interface the finite elements again. Uh, finite elements again gives you a local sort of localized uh, formulation. Uh, empirical type binding we did a lot, uh, and we also interface to 
through the FTD blast. And actually, behind the curtain, the Pioneer material studio is also using even EGF, and, and they also extended an interface to be more cute for instance. So if you buy the expensive software, in principle, you can have uh, an initial for the more interface to, to Green's function. But I don't know how much they develop that further. What I know is that recently, that's in the last few years, I also developed for um, interfacing phone calculation, coherent phonon transport can be done. Uh, and this is in the code called phonons. This is in, in the release of the FTB. You can search in the different apps. And you have uh, yesterday, uh, Ben talked about um, the mode, mode code, modes. And there is a, a code called phonons that allows you to calculate the phonon dispersions, also similar to phonon file, but also allows you to calculate. Um, uh, transmission of phonon coherently from one contact to, to from one reservoir to, to another. And that gives you information complementary to what you could do with molecular dynamics. For but unfortunately, I don't have much time to go to that. <laughs> <laughs>